Coming up next, the Booketing records a podcast, just like always. Ba, 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 da, ba, ba, da, ba. I'll be doing the music myself. Ba, 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 da, 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 da. You think I'd remember how our theme song went, but we're just beginning, folks. I'm not going to put a theme song in today. You know what happened today, Brandon? What happened to you? What what's what's been happening to you lately? I had to stay the night in Illinois last night. Yeah. In Springfield, the capital. It's not as nice as it sounds. Well, that's what happened to Brandon. What happened to me is I had an incredibly frustrating t- day where technology wouldn't work the way I wanted to. My uh, daughter peed on two p- perfectly good pillows. And, you know, it's just been one of those days. One of those days. So we love the booking. We, we don't really... necessarily love doing it. <laughs> no. We 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 love on every we'll, day. Yeah, no. I mean, we've done what? 250. By the way, we uh, completely forgot to celebrate the Bookalarian. <laughs> <laughs> it's about right. Folks, we're getting into our we'll we'll get into a new groove, but uh, that moment is lost though. Yeah, the the Bookalarian's lost. Yeah. You think there's no getting it back? Uh, we're on the 251 now, right? Yeah, I think this is 251. So the the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight discussion was our book hilarious. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, that was a pretty good discussion, I think. But I'm sure it was. I, I, it was fun to talk about Sir Gawain, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Or Sir Gawana. Sir Iguana. Sir Iguana. And the Mean Green. The Knight of the Sir Iguana. <laughs> the Knight of the Sir. Listen, folks, it's been a heck of a week for both of us, and it's only Tuesday. This episode comes out tomorrow, which, you know. Probably not the best way to be doing things, but. No, we're, we're going to get into a new groove here. But Nathan today, is just that good at editing. I am that good at editing, but today you're, 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 you're not going to get a theme song. You're going to get the theme song as I sang it to you. He's just trusting we can pull this together. He's trusting that I know a thing or two about Sir Thomas Mallory. I trust that Brandon knows a thing or nine about Sir T.M., Sir Thomas Mallory. I was driving all day, so we're going to be good. Plenty of time to think about Sir Thomas Mallory. We're fine. We're fine. No, it's it's just been a crazy week. I'm, I'm I'm a great proponent of honesty in podcasting, and... You know, people have been with us through the ups and the downs and the sidewayses and the everything else. They've been here for murder mysteries with Dubstep Danny and trials with Ready Player One. And Jake's not here, so possibly a real murder mystery as to where the Jake go. Well, we murdered him. Yeah. No no more mystery. (laughs) But they'll never guess how. Yeah, or why. (laughs) That's true. Although if they listened to that last podcast Jake was on, they might understand a little bit of why. That was the one where he was using the bobblehead and all that. Yeah, he made us mad. Yeah. We shot him. We shot him. (laughs) So they know now that now you know how and why. But they don't know where. You don't know where and you don't know when. One of his kids' baseball games, it was really awful. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Eight seventeen Central Standard Time, post Meridian. We just walked onto the baseball field. Brandon Gave him the old headshot, as we like to call it. Yep. I said, and, bobble that. And Brandon was wearing gloves at the time. He threw the gun down and walked away as as one does. Or no, you don't throw it. You kind of, in the movies, they, they're wearing gloves and they kind of walk away and they just drop it into a trash can or something like that. Yep. You might get a little background noise of my dog whimpering for a minute. That's okay. We are a pro dog. We're pro dog. Pro dog. Podcast. This is not the kind of dog you could walk around with in a, what are the baby Bjorns where they put the little dogs. Have you ever seen someone carrying a dog down around in a baby Bjorn? You know what I'm talking about? Baby, the guy from the (laughs) Hobbit that can turn into a bear? No, Nathan, those little baby holders that they'll, like baby backpacks. 
the daddies will wear? Mm-hmm. Like baby fanny packs, you'll wear your little baby on the front of your belly or something? Yeah. I mean, you I'm, seen this? I'm, I'm aware that such things exist. Well, some people will carry their little dogs around in that, but this dog is not the kind that you carry around in that because he is a Great Pyrenees and he's already huge. There you go. If anybody. Now, this is scintillating conversation. This is scintillating conversation. The fact is, Brandon, often, he's he's trying to throw you off the scent, <laughs> no pun intended, because mm-hmm. Brandon often has his dog attached to his chest and yeah. carries him around, and Brandon kind of has to stagger around because the dog is like 150 pounds or something like that, so it's yeah, pretty it's still cute. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's very adorable. People will rub Brandon's chin. Yeah. I think it's so adorable. And try to give me dog treats. And try to give Brandon dog treats. It's very strange. <sighs> Listen, folks. Have I mentioned that it's been a heck of a week? You have. Have I mentioned that, I mean, we love doing the book thing, but, you know, today just isn't the the greatest day. It's just the way that the cards fell. It's the way that the cards fell. They don't usually fall this way. Usually they tumble into perfect (laughs) podcasting. Anyway, let's talk about Sir Thomas Mallory. That'll probably improve both of our moods, eh? Sure. This is going to be a shorter episode, right, Nathan? (laughs) I think it probably will be, folks, but we love you. Please love us. We're trying to give you a, a new episode every week. We're, we're going to get our act together. We promise. We've all got no life outside of the booking, actually. This is all we do, and this is still all that we come up with. <laughs> yeah, we spent all week planning. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This is all scripted, actually. We thought that this would be the best way to make people... Every word carefully planned out. Prior to podcasting. Every word very, very, very carefully planned out prior to podcasting. It's our motto. That's our motto. All right. And speaking of mottos, what's a motto with Sir Thomas Mallory? A lot was a motto with Sir Thomas Mallory. As far as we know, he actually, so he kind of has the Shakespeare mystique in the sense that we really don't know a whole lot about his early eight years. And really what we do know about him comes from Lamort D'Arthur. So I don't know if you've started reading it yet, but he gives those little parts at the end of the chapters where he talks about himself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so there are parts in Lamort D'Arthur where he'll say, please pray for the author of this book who is currently imprisoned, things like that. And so there's a little bit of a romance surrounding Sir Thomas Mallory. Probably most people have heard the story of how he was in prison when he wrote this book. Had you ever heard that before? No, I, I know very little about Sir oh. Thomas Mallory. Well, that's kind of the one fact. If anybody knows anything about Sir Thomas Mallory in this book, they know that he wrote this in prison. And so, but even that, so you have to understand that, one, one again, we don't really know a lot about him, but if he was a knight or of any sort of nobility, being imprisoned at that time wasn't quite what we would think of it as today. So, for example, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who we mentioned a couple episodes ago, Henry II's wife brought in the whole chivalric romance tradition from Aquitaine and Normandy into England, right? Right. She was put into prison later in her life because she tried to lead an insurrection against her husband with uh, her two boys, Richard and John. And guess what? Henry II didn't really uh, like that all that much. And so he put her in a prison, but prison was being trapped in a castle. And so, you know, not really not really as bad as we would think of it. So he did write it in prison, but we don't even know which prison he was in. He could have very well have been imprisoned in his like ancestral home. He could have been imprisoned in some other guy's state. There are questions as to maybe he was imprisoned in an abbey. One of the things that most everybody acknowledges is that he had to be imprisoned where there were lots and lots of books. Because if there were lots of other, he had to have some sort of access to resources to write this. Because there are signs that he had, there's evidence that he had access to Jeffrey Monmouth's books, who we've talked about. I don't think we mentioned the fact that the way that Jeffrey Monmouth came into pop culture at the time was through two guys named Wace and Leamon. If I did, this will just be a little bit of a review. No, Wace was the fr- Wace was from Normandy. And he translated Jeffrey Monmouth's book into French. And Leamon, a couple years later, translated it into uh, English. 
so that they could have access in their countries. And they both added their own elements. I think that Wace added actually the round table. So they kind of, Eve chatted a little bit of their own flavor to it. But anyways, he would have had access through either knowing Latin or through one of those sources. He would have had access to what was called the Vulgate Cycle, which was, I think Robert de Boron was the guy's name, but he wrote some Arthurian romances and then other French uh, troubadours would take those up and put them into, add their own elements and their own stories to it. And they eventually formed what was called the Vulgate Cycle, which was the story of Arthur, you know, with Excalibur all the way through some of the romances and the grail until the final, the dissolution. And Lancelot was introduced as with his adulterous affair with, with his adulterous affair, with his adul- adultery with mm-hmm. <laughs> Guinevere. And this affair. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he would have had access to things like that. And so most scholars think that he must have been somewhere where he would have actually had those books and had easy access to those books. And so, but his early life is so clouded in mystery that nobody really knows like where even that was. There are guesses. I think some people think that there's apparently, so I listened to a couple things on this actually, and there are some scholars like a group of Oxford scholars that were talking about this and they were much less willing to assert things about facts about his life. Mm-hmm. And so they were the ones that were like offering, offering up all these conjectures. And then I listened to these two like homeschool moms or something talking about this. And they were the ones that like seemed, were saying, well, he was in an abbey where he was uh, imprisoned and there was a library at the abbey. And you're like, well, how do you know that? How do you know that? And they didn't offer up how they knew that, but they seemed to think he did, uh, was in prison there in an abbey. That was a confusing sentence. But so another interesting thing is that he was imprisoned apparently in the same prison that Dickens' father was imprisoned in during his first bout of criminal activity. And so we'll get to that in just a minute. So what do we know about Mallory? Well, we know that he referenced himself as a knight and of having some sort of title. And so they think that they know, scholars think they know, who he most likely is, and that would be Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold. This guy was the son of John Mallory, who was not responsible for, but was involved with, because his overlord was in, was involved in an, in an insurrection against Henry IV. Mm-hmm. And so he had to kind of claw his way back into the favor of Henry the Fourth, and but all that to say, they were servants of the king and they were close to the king. And so Thomas Mallory, if this is the right Sir Thomas Mallory, even though not a lot is known about his childhood, we do know that eventually he was knighted. Eventually he was actually made a member of Parliament. And what was unfortunate for him is that right during his lifetime was the end of the Hundred Years' War and the beginnings of the War of the Roses, Mm -hmm. which we have talked about quite a bit last year. And so he was ensconced in all of that crud. Hmm. And so what you had happen is with Henry V's death and then moving into Henry VI, who was kind of a weaker king, with Henry VI, you had a lot of the old English lands that were held in France and that were fought for during the Hundred Years' War. They began to lose them. Mm -hmm. And so that led to discontent and that led to a weak central government. And so things just began to collapse and you had a lot of the barons and lords fighting one another. Mm -hmm. And that would eventually lead to the discontent that would cause the Hundred Years, I mean, not the Hundred Years, the War of the Roses. War of the Roses, yeah. And so especially with Richard II, I mean, if if you know anything about him or go and read Shakespeare's play, you can find out all about him. Just very weak, decentralized government, lords fighting one another, the king not really having any desire to lead. And so finally... That, and that had led to all the Henrys, right? Mm-hmm. So you kind of had a reflex, a repeat of it here that would lead to the War of the Roses. I went about that in a really confusing way. Richard II was not the War of the Roses, but Richard II, you know, had led to Henry IV. Right. And so here with Henry VI, and so then Edward IV comes and he takes over. And eventually you have the uprisings that caused the Houses of York fighting the Houses of Lancaster for the throne, right? Mm-hmm. And Mallory would be, like I said, right in the middle of all this. Apparently, there was a duke who was not very happy with Sir Thomas Mallory, partly because Sir Thomas Mallory apparently kidnapped him at one point. (laughs) And so there is a rap sheet that this guy has, if this is the real 
Thomas Mallory of, of Newbald, if he really is the guy. He was a horse thief. He was a thief. He was a kidnapper. He was a rapist, which, mm. you know. Now, some of the people, so one of the things that we will talk about when we move into Lamar Darthur is how do you, how do you make sense of this guy being the writer of the chivalric code of Lamar Darthur, you know? Mm-hmm. One of the ways that people make sense of it is that, well, during this period, dukes could pretty much accuse anybody of anything. Mm-hmm. And if you were their enemy, just because you had these accusations doesn't mean they were true. Right. You know? And also, apparently, husbands at the time, uh, to get around accusing their wives of adultery, could say that if, they're, if they caught their wife with a lover, they could accuse that man of rape. So there is that possibility, too. Right. It doesn't kind of get him out of it, but if that's the case, then it actually does fit with his weird, that whole weird idea of the chivalric excuse for adultery. Sure. You know, that we'll talk plenty about, I'm sure. Anyways... What really got this guy into trouble, what really got this particular Thomas Mallory into trouble was that he was involved, even though he was a Yorkist, he was involved later on with trying to overthrow Edward IV. And so this got, put him, this got him thrown into prison where he would then write the Mart Darthur. Interesting. And this seems like the likeliest candidate for being the actual Sir Thomas Mallory. There are a couple others. They're like two Thomas Mallory's from England, but neither of them were knights. And then you had one from uh, Wales, but there's no evidence that really this Thomas Mallory was of Welsh descent. And so this seems to be the likeliest guy. Do they all have scholarly defenders? And They do, but this one's this guy is who most scholars think is has to be the Sir Thomas Mallory. And the big reason being that those other two, as far as I know, didn't have, they weren't knights. They didn't have the title. And this guy was very, I mean, it doesn't mean that he wouldn't just make up a title for himself. But right. the things that he says about himself in Lamarck D'Arthur seem to match pretty well with this Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold. Mm-hmm. So anyways... But like Shakespeare, we don't know a whole lot about this guy, right? What we do know about him comes through his work. To be honest, the... To be honest, the, whatever. Stop lying, Brandon. Yeah, I know. I've just been lying to you guys this entire time. But finally, I'm going to be honest. Uh, Nathan, time yes. to be honest. Ready? Okay, let's do it. One, two, ready? three, go. Well, I think that this actually kind of fits. This whole story with the... Uh, if anybody has read or read last year with us the War of the Roses... Mm-hmm. With Shakespeare, you see people lying and accusing one another and doing all these sort of awful things that they probably would have never expected themselves to do Mm -hmm. because they were doing it either in the name of a lord or they were doing it in the name of passion in the moment, whatever it is, you know? So I don't think that just because he got wrapped up in all the horrible bloodshed and awfulness of this period necessarily cancels him out as being the guy who would write Lamort D'Arthur. Also, he could have been an awful guy and still just have really liked Arthurian stories and been a decent writer and still have written Lamort D'Arthur. I mean, and so this, I think that there's good reason to think this was him because some of the... maybe so bold, uh, Lamort D'Arthur has plenty of violence and sexual intrigue and it's not the most squeaky clean rendering of the Arthurian legend. (laughs) Yeah, and there's actually some interesting things. I was listening to someone point out that the whole treachery between Arthur and Lancelot and the stuff that would happen between Lancelot's house and Gawain's house, that seems to really be reflective of the War of the Roses, right? And somebody who was very knowledgeable of the sort of house infighting that was... Co- and so it seems to be a commentary on the times. And so it makes sense that it would be somebody who was embroiled in the middle of it all, right? So anyways... So in prison, he writes... So he has access to all these books and... We don't need to rehash all the history of Arthurian legends, right? People can go back and listen to that first episode. Mm-hmm. He would have had access to all that stuff we've talked about, the Wace and Laomon that we introduced today. And he wrote this manuscript while he was in prison. And then when he gets out, falls into the hands of this guy, really interesting figure named William Caxton. William Caxton's a guy that everybody should know about because he was a merchant who went over to Europe and saw what was the fruit of this guy Gutenberg work, his work that has was quickly spreading like wildfire through Europe. And he said, Hey, we gotta get one of, of these back to England. In fact, I think he met 
one of the nobility from England in Bruges or something like that. And she said, hey, you got to bring this back to England. And so he does. And he sets up a printing press. One of the first books he prints is The Canterbury Tales. But one of his biggest hits is Lamorte d'Arthur. Nice. He gets a hold of this. And for a long time, Mallory's original manuscript was lost to us. We had no idea where it went. But Caxton's, two of Caxton's editions had survived. And so what Caxton did is he took it and it looks like he cleaned it up some. He edited it and he divided it into parts and also to chapters that could be easily read and sort of, you know, at night by the fire and little, like little episodes of a television show. Sure. How do we know that's what Caxton did? Well, because in the 1930s, the, the, this guy named Winchester, let me make sure I'm saying that right. Yeah, Winchester, hang on, sorry. He's not a more time there. Of course he is. Okay. So sorry. I, I knew that I was saying something wrong there. It was at Winchester College, and the guy's name was Walter Oakshot. Okay. There we go. Caught myself before someone gave us a one-star review for that. <laughs> Anyways, so it was found at Winchester College, and this guy was cataloging all their books that they had in their library. Lo and behold, he finds a manuscript that predated any of the Caxton editions. So this was probably the edition that Caxton worked off of to edit and create his book. And so anyone who's familiar with kind of like C.S. Lewis's love of medieval literature and stuff like that, he mentions this guy named Vinever. Mm -hmm. If you've looked into editions of Lamont D'Arthur, you've probably ran across the name Vinever too. This guy's, uh, so this was a scholar who heard about this, went there, took the Winchester manuscript and compared it to Caxton's editions and found out that, indeed, Caxton had separated it into chapters, had given it sort of more of a structure. And according to Vinever, he actually thought that Mallory had originally just written eight kind of individual stories that weren't necessarily meant to go together. Right, And so up until that point in history, most scholars thought that these books kind of went together and they would point back to the Vulgate cycle where in those stories, even though you have distinct tales about each of the knights, there's this process called interleaving where the stories will kind of pass in and out of one another. Mm. So one character will come into one person's story and there's this complicated pattern that kind of interleaves these things together. Does that make sense? Yeah. And... Vinever argued really hard that actually Mallory intended for these things to be more distinct than that. He kind of wanted to give it his own flavor that way. And so he produced his own edition. And so now today, you're, you're, you have two options in front of you. You can read Caxton's edition, or you can read the Vinever Winchester text. I think that the one we got is not the Winchester. Interesting. I think we got the Caxton. Hmm. So... What So what, the other things that became clear is that Caxton did edit quite a bit out, probably for the better for the most part, but he took out some of Sir Thomas Mallory's references to his own biography, things like that. And so you now have both of these editions where like two different folios of a Shakespeare play might exist. Hmm. Now you can go and you can see Mallory's original of Vision before it was edited. Now the way I look at it, it uh, I think that Mallory probably was closely involved with Caxton. Well, or at least I don't think he would have been upset with Caxton's editions. Right. I say that I need to make sure he was even alive when Caxton got a hold of his volume. One star. Yeah. Either way, I think the way to see it would be like, you know, what's his face? The editor of Genius, Pat Perkins, getting a, getting a hold of Thomas Wolfe's work and making it more structured. Sure. Right. Thomas Wolfe is still the genius behind it, but Maxwell Perkins certainly gave it structure that helped it become what it is. Yeah. And so Caxton took it, he gave it some structure, he he organized it. And so but yeah, there's a lot there's a whole history of debate now surrounding I don't and I think it's actually probably part of his history that nobody really knows. I can't tell. Both of these sources that I had, neither of them are saying that Mallory and Caxton knew one another. I think it's kind of a Maybe just a historical question mark as to how it got into Caxton's hands. Let's see. I can probably figure this out, Nathan. Now I'm really interested. That is interesting. I mean, it's not like there would have been a, a whole bunch of outstanding copyright law and things like that, right? It's entirely possible Caxton was just like, I like this. I'm going to print it. You know, yeah. It's the sort of thing that 
Happened. Yeah, I mean, he was dead in 1471, if this is the right, Ca- right Mallory, and Caxton's edition was in 1485. Doesn't mean that they didn't know one another, though. I think that some scholars think they did. I think, I think Vendiver kind of thought they did, because there's evidence that the, even the edition that he had, the Winchester edition, had some printer's dust on the edges. So Caxton obviously had it in his office at one point. Hmm. So, I mean, who knows? You know, it's this part of the mystery of all this. And not knowing... I mean, think of how people are going to try to put the threads together of your life, Nathan, years after, if nobody writes your biography. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. I'll just have to start writing my own autobiography. Yeah, right. Your autobiography. And so, anyways... Those are the two, so those are some of the bigger stories behind Lamort D'Arthur, behind how it came into existence, behind Thomas Mallory, behind what we're about to get into. If anybody's never read this before, Tom Mallory writes in what you would consider early Middle English, not l- kind of late Middle English, but it's even it's easier even than Chaucer's Middle English. But you'll still probably want a modernized translation, otherwise a lot of it's going to seem strange to you. But with his writing, you do see the transition right then that was happening into modern English, because it really is very close to sounding like just a Shakespeare play. His prose is pretty straightforward and moves pretty fast. There's a lot of repetitions, but I do think that it lends him a lot of uh, weight in the heavy parts. Like he does the tragedy really well. Mm -hmm. Like when you have to break up the round table, man, it's, it's really sad stuff. And so, but you'll have to decide, do you want the pre-edited, uncut, I guess it would be like the director's cut, Mallory? Mm -hmm. Or do you want the one that was packaged to be sent out to the plebes, which would be William Caxton's Mallory? And you can enter in, there's a lot of debate. You can go read, Vinever has a few articles that he wrote on this. C.S. Lewis, I think, weighed in on this. There's a a whole rich history of scholarly debate that we're not going to resolve today because that just has to be up to you guys what you want to go and read. But so now you kind of know your options and you can go and make that decision. Do you have an opinion? I generally would go with William Caxton's just because that's the one that's historically handed down to us. And I'd like to think that Mallory kind of wanted the edits. Mm -hmm. But I I see the reason. I've read the Vinever edition and for a long time I was kind of a Vinever purist like that. Mm-hmm. One of one of the actual Vinever text, but I think when 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 even if it's an accident of history when for hundreds of years people have used a certain version, you have to give that version some respect or at least keep it in the conversation. You yep. know, it's like do you want to read the Hemingway movable feast that got released and that everybody knows or do you want to read the unrevised edition that's 400 extra pages and yeah eh, and you know. really the changes are min- kind of minimal so you're really looking at being more of a structure issue like do you like the page break do you like the chapter breaks do you like that sort of thing right the sort of structure that william caxton brought to it but which generally speaking i'm a big fan of that sort of structure. and there are there are other editions out there apparently but some of those like just lost significant portions of the text just from carelessness mm-hmm. so i would say if you're going to choose choose from the Vinever or from the Caxton. So Vinever or Caxton. Yep. Why is this version? Or I mean, why is Mallory like the guy? I suppose we'll talk about this more as we talk about Mallory, but, but why is this kind of the <laughs> penultimate or not the penultimate, the, what would you say? This is like the version of Arthur in a lot of people's minds. Why is that? Well, there's a few reasons. This is an important, both in Arthurian and in literary history. He's the first to kind of bring together both the uh, French and the Welsh and the old, just the historical Arthur into one source like this. And so, I mean, just for sheer size and sheer effort, I think that's one of the reasons that it's the most important of the Arthurian texts. It finally brings all these sources that had kind of been out there telling the same story into one place and has them meet. You know, it's like the, it's like the, Infinity Wars, the Arthurian romances. Right. So here they all come, and they're going to meet right here in this in this one. So yeah, if you know Arthur's stories, you'll find them here. I mean, you'll find Merlin, you'll find Morgana Le Fay, you'll find Lancelot and Guinevere's story, you'll find Adventures of Gawain, you'll find the Grail stuff. I mean, there's not 
there's not any famous Arthur or anything that you're not going to find here. And he made almost none of it up, but uh, there also just is the charm of his style. He's a good writer and he's a good storyteller. I think that a lot of his unique position in history allowed for him to draw on. I mean, I really did buy into this argument that I was listening to that the War of the Roses heavily influenced the structure and way that he wrote this, that mm -hmm. he was, that it helped that he was seeing all these things happen around him. Right. And it is a commentary on his time. Literarily, it's important because this is one of the most, this is one of the first, it's not the first, but it's the most important Arthurian prose work in English and is one of the earliest baby novels that we have, right? It's not necessarily a novel, but it's getting really close to where the novel would get created. And so for this to be just a work of prose fiction was really uncommon. I mean, you think about it, the Canterbury Tales was in a verse. And almost all the Arthurian romances were in verse. And so this was unusual for, to have a work of fiction like this in prose. And so in that way, it was kind of revolutionary, right? Is, I mean, you could make an argument that this is, this is one of the first early novels. So Interesting. So yeah, that's definitely why it deserves its place that it has in both Arthurian, at, at the height, at the top of all the Arthurian stuff and also just in its place in English history mm -hmm. as far as literature and English literary history. So yeah, you will see throughout this book. And I think that Mallory's own history kind of opens up the question of chivalry and what is chivalry. Apparently the war of the roses, both sides are kind of throw around the term, both to defend what they were doing and to attack what their opponents were doing. Mm hmm. Pretty much chivalry became a catch-all phrase to mean it's whatever I'm doing that my opponent isn't doing. <laughs> it's kind of like the term gentleman, you know? Mm -hmm. So the idea of it was supposed to, it started with the French horseman, which was Cavalier, I think. And so it had to do with actual codes of fighting on horseback. And so you were supposed to not take unfair advantage of your opponent. You were supposed to have, and you were supposed to have largesse and kindness to all, Right. And then that kind of opened up with the French uh, literature and the French Arthurian romances. And also, Ma it's called the Matters of France, which means like Charlemagne and those stories of their own history in the French courts to come to be associated also with Christianity and with the idea of courtly love. And then the whole messiness that those, you know, those really aren't compatible to have this whole courtly love and the tension then that arises from a knight who wants to be faithful to a woman that he has no right to even think that he can be faithful to in the first place, you know, right? because she's someone else's wife. Right. And so you get all this weirdness that just, and so emerges and comes up to the surface with this chivalric tradition. But I'm sure we'll talk a whole lot about that and probably look more into chival, look more at chivalry in more detail, but you definitely are going to see it here in Lamort D'Arthur. And a large part of it, I think, does have to do with Mallory's own background being a knight. And I think it's even more of a reason to think that he probably was this particular Mallory. Mm -hmm. So anyways. Uh, maybe, maybe we should say, what does it mean in, in Mallory's era to be a knight? Is this someone who owns land or just somebody who fights for the king? Or It's kind of like a soldier, but with a bit more rank. So like an officer. Okay. So, I mean, you had to be knighted. You had to be given that position, right? You could go and you could just make your peasants be soldiers, but the knights had a bit more seriousness to the role. Mm -hmm. It was a position, a, a, an honored, what am I trying to say? I mean, are they You're, part of the noble class then? No, not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, it's complicated. But they're not yeah, peasants so not, or serfs either then. Yeah, they're not peasants or serfs, but they're not necessarily lords, right? They're not the nobility, but they definitely would be part of the higher class. I mean, they could go into court and stuff like that. So, yeah. Interesting. And in the Arthurian legends, you're going to often see that these knights are also lords of their own lands, like Lancelot. Right. So, but let's see. Medieval knight. Rank. Oh, yeah, I'd be interested, Nathan. 
Uh, yeah, okay. so a knight was technically just a man who served his sovereign or lord as a mounted soldier huh. in armor. So I think it came to have some of the more heightened ranking later on, probably around this time when it's beginning to get imbued with Arthurian romance and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's worth looking into. I'll have to look more into that. That'd be That's something worth knowing a little bit more about the history of the knights and if they ever did. That's just, that's, that is something I'm not, I don't know right off the top of my head is whether they ever became, whether or not the knight class became a noble class, I guess is what. Right. I don't know. It almost seems like it, but I don't know if that's true, actually. You think about them that way, or I do, precisely because of the Arthurian le- legends, because yeah. Lancelot's got his own castle. And and I think that a lot of that has to do with the Arthurian romance, like I'm, like, you know, but I'm not sure it's historically true. I think that they were just soldiers, but with a little bit more rank than an average, like, surf peasant soldier. Mm-hmm. So... Oh, that's interesting. That'll, that maybe we can uh, find a little bit more out of. I'm, I'll be I'm sure there is a history that. of this, but yeah, well, that, that might be a good cliffhanger for next for next week's episode. Yeah. We can talk a little bit more about nuts. You're looking at something interesting. Well, so he was knighted. His if this is the right guy, then his father and mother were sir and lady, so they off they obviously had some sort of royal title. Hmm. I mean, noble title. Yeah. But to be knighted is to just be honored as a warrior. All right. I keep thinking about Sir Thomas from was closely Mansfield linked with, Park. Yeah, so in the Middle Ages was closely linked with horsemanship from its origins in the 12th century until its final flowering as a fashion among the high nobility in the 15th century. Okay. So I think it was just became fashionable to be knighted and to be a knight. Okay, so all the kind, kind of, of accoutrement accumulates. Yeah, and, and so like you would want to be, so like the whole jousting and stuff like that, and then you would prove yourself as a warrior, and then some noble would knight you. And there you go. Now you get to be, you know, sir. Because I think that in that sense, his father probably, his parents probably didn't have the title that was inherited. You probably had to earn it yourself. But since your father had it, you had a pretty easy access to earning it. All this stuff gets really complicated and confuses the heck out of me. Yeah. Anyways. I trying to untangle the War of the Roses from but I think that, last year. But I think that does help solve some of it. It definitely was a fashionable thing to try and be a knight in right. the 15th century, which is where we're talking about. So. Well, there you go. Maybe we can talk about a little bit more about it next week. But now, folks, Brandon's got to go, like, kiss his wife or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I've got to go do the same thing. Not kiss Brandon's wife. No. I'd rather go kiss, kiss my wife. So, given the weeks that we've had, Brandon, do you think that the folks would mind if we didn't do donor shout-outs? Do you think anyone would be angry no, at us? I don't us? think they'd mind. I think that we actually gave them a little bit longer episode than I thought we were. So Yes, yes, me too. So, yeah, we love you guys. Go to patreon.com forward slash the booking to support this podcast. Get a donor shout-out on most episodes, not this one. If Jake shows up, we'll make him stick around and do that while we get off. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. (laughs) But I don't think Jake's going to show up. We did shoot him in the head after all. Oh, yeah, he did. He did. Now, would that be considered chivalrous to just walk onto a baseball field and shoot someone in the head? It depends. (laughs) It does depend, doesn't it? There's lots of circumstances where one can imagine that being the most chivalrous thing you could do. Yeah. But then there's sometimes when it's just he's hiding a cool. machine gun in that bat. And he's yeah. about to mow down the whole little league. Well, I guess we didn't mention that Jake is a, or was trying to become. His aspiration was to become a serial murderer of children. So that's a pretty important detail as to why we shot him. So we are Lancelot and Gawain. That's right. We are Lancelot and Gawain. Jake was both a serial murderer and he was annoying with that bobblehead. So and he got wouldn't we feel bad deserved. if Jake actually got shot? What if we what if we get done with this episode and then we find out Jake was shot in the head? We're gonna have some explaining to do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we would have some explaining to do. All right, folks. We're gonna be done right now because we choose to be. Thank you for Bearing with us. We'll be back with a really exciting 
fully fleshed out episode next week. Right, Brandon? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Happy reading. Yay.